For the third section of this class, we're going to talk about historical cartography and what we can learn from how past people represented places. The main point that I want to bring through in this discussion is that the experience and representation of space are culturally constructed. The example I'm sharing here is a map that illustrates a travel log. The travel log is written by de Carvajal, who accompanied Francisco de Orellana uh, when he took an expedition in the Amazon. The map itself is made by um, Antonio Piero, uh, Piera, a Portuguese seaman, um, in one of the European courts uh, during this time. So it's important to note that this uh, travel log is light on the details of uh, that I would find most interesting. Um, what happened is uh, Francisco de Orellana split off um, from uh, Pizarro, his commanding officer. They were stuck in the Amazon, they were lost, they were obviously all going to die. Orellana takes some of the men and all the supplies and gets to the closest town, promising he'll come back to Pizarro. But he doesn't. He decides that that's a good way for all of them to die. So instead, he spends five months following the Amazon uh, until he reaches the ocean and eventually gets back to Europe. De Carvajal, uh, his account is specifically written in order to be used as evidence at the inevitable mutiny trial. Um, so they know that if... Uh, Pizarro is going to, has any chance of surviving that they're going to be in big trouble. So this account is mostly about how um, Orellano had no choice. They had to take over. It was required. Uh, and how terrible everything was, uh, which it does seem to have been terrible. I'm using this example um, because it's used in the book 1491 um, because it talks just a little bit about those communities in the Amazon that they encountered as they were getting to the ocean for those five months. Um, so within this map, we have three types of historical information, at least. First is the history of the journey. The map includes notes about things like, here we built the boat. Um, the second thing it includes is a little bit of information about the landscape of the Amazon basin. Um, certainly the path of the river is remarkably accurate. It also includes a little bit of information about the people living in the Amazon basin. The reason it shows up in the book 1491 is that it's one of the only uh, sources of direct primary evidence that we have for the density of occupation in the Amazon. And nobody believed de Carvajal. He wrote about fantastical things in the same account. Um, but archaeology has come back around on this and has this, um, has found a lot of evidence for actually quite dense occupation in the Amazon. Um, and it uh, gives additional credence to the discussions of the many communities and their size that de Carvajal recorded as they, as they move through this landscape. I think the main thing that this map can give us information about, however, is the transmission of geographic knowledge um, about the new world among European map makers. That what we're finding here is the record of the transmission of that cartographic knowledge um, within the context of the European courts and uh, claiming of territory in the new world. Um, so what we find about the history of the journey is somewhat incidental and what we find about the population of the Amazon is perhaps even more incidental. Um, and the whether we're able to use this to talk about the landscape of the Amazon in the uh, 1500s is difficult, right? Like, how can we know what parts of the map are reliable? How can we know what parts of the travel log are reliable? A single line of evidence isn't really sufficient in order for us to make a historical reconstruction. This is an example of some of the prehistoric maps of Asia. I got this graphic from the Historical Cartography of East Asia, uh, which is from a series of books, uh, all available for free in PDF on the University of Chicago website. I'll put the links down in the notes below. Um, this particular graphic uh, I have pulled out because it, uh, it shows across a large selection of time and places, um, examples of topological uh, spatial representations. And the author of this chapter is making an, what I think is an interesting argument that very early maps are do not look at all like we expect them to. We expect uh, Euclidean geometry, that direction and shape and size are all preserved and represented as accurately as possible on a two-dimensional surface. And this is really important if you need to do something like navigate through a space you've never been before. But prehistoric maps 
As far as we can tell, we have found none that serve that purpose. Instead, they're serving some other purpose, right? I think these are maps for insiders rather than maps for outsiders, perhaps. His point is that with the type of spatial relationship that these diagrams are preserving is topology rather than Euclidean geometry. And by typology, what he means is that the connectedness is what's important. What's together and what's connected, what's inside and what's outside, these are topological relationships. And he believes that this is what's most important in the examples that he's collected here. Um, and these are fairly schematic, right? Most of them show sort of a single building um, they're giving you information about the relationship of people and animals to these enclosed, evidently, spaces. Um, their interpretation is uh, can very much up in the air. And it is worth pointing out that prehistoric maps or spatial representations actually make up a very small corpus of any of the early art, uh, most of which is rock art either incised or painted, um, a very small proportion of that is actually images that could be understood as spatial representations or maps. Um, nonetheless, uh, all art in the prehistoric period is of interest as a spatial representation. The idea of representing something on a wall, um, on a surface, is ne necessarily a spatial act. And this is really important for sort of discussions of very uh, early, behavioral modernity, we call it. So maybe 40 to 50,000 years ago, or potentially as far back as 150,000 years ago, it depends on the evidence that we keep finding, we have examples of abstract representations of art. Um, and this is one of the main markers for what we call behavioral modernity, when Homo sapiens started acting like us. Um, and the reason the abstract uh, depictions that art of any kind is really important is that it is uh, shows a degree of abstract thinking and of planning um, and uh, metaphorical thought that is different, we believe, than what came before in early humans and uh, early human relatives. It's really much later that we get clear examples of um, maps as we think of them. Um, this particular example comes from 1500 BC uh, from Mesopotamia. This is a map that shows the uh, who owns different plots of land. It has notes about the measurements of those plots of land and it records the where the canals and the river are running as landmarks. Um, at this time, we have evidence that land surveying itself is professional. Um, we have examples of royal land surveyors who survey land for the king. They don't tend to record their uh, surveyings in documents like you see here on the left. Instead, during this period, they make these beautiful big boundary stones and actually stick them in the ground itself. No map required. Um, but that's only for royal grants of land. When normal people want to sell their land, they have to make sure that everybody agrees where the boundaries are. So these maps become a part of the property document. Um, and in order to sell the land, you give the buyer all of the documents leading up to it that support their claim to it. So if there's ever a lawsuit, that they can prove that they have ownership through, through by, by buying it from you. Um, the other reason that uh, land surveying is important in this period is that um, the king is collecting taxes based on the amount of land you have. So if you have a lot of fields and they know they're really good, they will expect you to pay more in taxes. Um, the amount of tax is based, I think, not only on the size, but also on the productivity of that land. Um, this is a really pretty prosaic type of map, right? This is much more... Um, like you would find in the records document of your town hall of, to, to prove that you bought your house, than many of the other examples we've been looking at. It's very small scale, it's individual, it's supporting economic activity, it's supporting the apparatus of the state. Um, in this particular period, the maps have a purpose that look really familiar to me, which I find really fascinating. In contrast, this map is from a few hundred years later. Uh, it's probably itself dates to 600 BC, but might be based on a 900 BC example. This puts it firmly into the uh, Neo-Assyrian Empire. And this appears to be a map of propaganda of the state. It's not supporting tax collection, but it is supporting a certain idea of the world. Um, 
I'll explain a little bit about the traditional reading of it, and then I'm going to give you another one. The traditional reading is that this map shows Babylon at the center of the world, and everything else is an uncivilized periphery. The circle that you can see um, here, this is the bitter water. This is the ocean um, that surrounds the known world. Here are the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers crossing the known world. Babylon ought to be right about there. Down here we see some marshes, and out here we see distant lands that are marked by their strangeness. Uh, most interpretations of this have taken it as a static map, sort of a cosmological diagram that explains uh, the importance of Babylon. Um, and Babylon is certainly important, and indeed it is the cosmological center of the Mesopotamian world in this period. Um, an alternative reading has been proposed by De Paul Den Paul Del Nero, who is actually a professor of mine in the Department of Near Eastern Studies at Johns Hopkins. Um, he wrote a paper that says that uh, argues that this static reading of the map is really limiting and doesn't make a lot of sense with the evidence. Um, first of all, one of the named sites is in entirely the wrong side of the map. Based on the other sites that are named in there, they're labeled if you can't tell. The little circles are usually sites. Um, it, it should be in the west, and it is, in fact, in the east. Um, uh, also, Babylon is not actually at the center of the map. It's off to the side. Um, he also has noted that the direction of the writing shifts as it moves around the bitter waters. Uh, and he argues that all of these things together suggest that the map is meant to be moved. And instead of a static depiction of the landscape, it's really an itinerary. Um, so it's not showing it from a bird's eye view all at once. It is instead showing a route. And what that route appears to be is walking through the close familiar area. And then you cross over the bitter waters um, at this point up here in number three into a specific type, into a, a, one of the outlying areas. You get a lot of information about the outlying areas. It has things about how far it is to the next one. And using this, uh, these notations about distances and directions, he is arguing that we should read um, an itinerary that starts at number one, moves around the inside in this direction, crosses over at the top, and then moves back around the outside in this direction. Um, and the uh, what this might mean is less clear. Um, the earlier example where we saw it as a static interpretation of the Babylonian cosmology was really nice because it lined up well with a myth where we fly over the world and we see Babylon at the center uh, called the Enuma Elish. It's a scene that we have in, in literature from this period. This one doesn't map up as well, although it does perhaps align with another type of spatial representation common in Mesopotamia going back a thousand years, um, which is the itinerary, that the moving around and the recording of which place to which place is a type of, of um, spatial representation that's, that's quite important. We see it in the um, Mesopotamian King's List as power moves around. We see it in Gilgamesh as our hero journeys from the known world to the unknown world, moving from this known center to the far periphery. Um, but it, he, I think Del Nero has made a good argument that it's more complicated than purely a defined interior and exterior, a known and unknown, a civilized and uncivilized. It is instead uh, logical to me that it's about moving through the known world, including these areas outside the Bitter River. Another well-studied example of sort of more schematic representations that have a lot of importance for the people who make them are the Mapa Mundi, the maps of the world. These are common in the uh, Middle Ages, um, and there's a few things about them that I want to point out. First of all, they're called T and O maps because they have the same similar organization to the Babylonian map of the world that we just looked at. Some people have said that might be the first example, although I think that's a bit um, bit of a reach. Um, instead, what you see, uh, the T is created by Asia being at the top, Europe at the bottom left, and Africa on the bottom right, surrounded by the, uh, by the ocean. Um, if we were to project the map as we know it today into this same method, it would look something like this, this image on the right. Um, this is useful because it's well balanced, right? It has all of the known stuff. Uh, there's some idea that the first person to use this projection was aware that this was only half the sphere, but it was the known half of the sphere. Very logical. 
These particular Mapa Mundi, this one is from Hereford, um, and I'm going to ask you to explore it as an activity this week. Um, these are not simply cartographic representations of the surface of the globe. They encode, encode a lot of other information. Uh, one of the most noticeable things that they do is they place paradise at the top. The Garden of Eden is included in the far east of the map. Um, again, north would be over here, east over here with this projection. Um, as you can see, paradise is separated from the world. It's not accessible to these, but it is a, a real place in that it is included on this map. Um, Jerusalem is almost always located right at the center. Uh, and these uh, objects are almost always, I think, always found in the context of um, religious scholarship. Uh, the one in Hereford uh, appears to be uh, part of a pilgrimage route. They think that partly because there's uh, so much damage and oil from where people have been touching Hereford itself. They're starting out there and they're walking somewhere else within, within the Christian world. The Hereford map also includes a lot of stories from the Bible that are mapped onto the landscape. It includes stories from classical Greece and Rome that are again mapped onto the landscape. Monsters and phenomenal beings um, placed that are giving information to the people looking at it. Uh, but instead of being a travel tool, it is really more of an encyclopedia. It collects in a lot of different types of knowledge there to given a spatial representation and then presented back out to the viewer. These would have been really prestigious objects, and they, they do seem to have been public in some capacity, um, particularly as, uh, in these examples of religious devotion, although they were also objects uh, for scholarly pursuit by the monks and others. So one of the activities that I'm suggesting today is that you explore the Hereford Mapa Mundi online. Um, it is uh, really beautifully displayed. It has a lot of information about the map itself, about the material that's on it, um, and the genre of maps more generally. Um, and I'd like you to reflect a little bit on uh, how you would describe this type of spatial representation. It's not, uh, you know, it's not precise in the way that we might think of maps being today. It's not for navigation like we sometimes think of maps being, um, but it has its own purposes and it, I would like to hear your thoughts on those. Um, I'd like you also to compare it to other types of maps. How is it different or similar? And I'm particularly interested if you can think of any modern examples of maps that feel like they have the same purpose as the Hereford Map of Mundi. Um, things that might be less about precision and more about um, a collection of knowledge or a cosmological understanding of the landscape. In addition, um, I want to discuss historical maps and I want to see examples of them. Please send me any favorites you have. Um, I will put the links to the historical map databases that I gave you last week. I'll put those again in the notes for this week. Go look through some things, find some things, um, uh, and uh, tell me two main things about it. What does it tell you about the person who made the map? And what does the content depicted in the map tell you about the past? I really want us to think hard about how we use historical maps in order to understand history, because it's not a simple one-to-one -one and it has a lot of pitfalls in it. Um, so I encourage you to explore what those might be. During this class, we covered the individual experience of space and their representations. We talked about fictional maps of imaginary places, and we talked a little bit about historical cartography and some of the information that it can encode for us about the societies map making those maps. Um, I hope that you will uh, respond to the discussion prompts and explore some of the activities I've suggested. Um, please do write to me uh, this week so that I can draw together some common themes and examples that you send in for the Friday video. Um, in addition to the listed activities and discussions, I'm always open to seeing more of your favorite maps. So if you come across anything that you find really interesting uh, throughout the course of this class, uh, even if it doesn't really relate to whatever the topic is that week, that's okay. I would love to see it. Um, and I look forward to hearing from you during this week. Thank you so much.